We work, we live, we innovate, and create. At the center of it all is your brain health. The ability to solve problems, think analytically, share empathy, and thrive. to make brain performance really the next fitness revolution. Scientific discoveries show that your brain can adapt and grow regardless of your starting point. The Center for Brain Health can show you how to transform your mind to work stronger and faster. We learned from a national poll that 95% of people want to do something about their brains. The problem is they don't know where or how to start. At the Center for Brain Health, we have easy to use, scientifically proven tools to provide people a proactive path to do just that, to help people everywhere improve their quality of life through brain health. What's exciting is that it's easy to start, and starting is urgent because we are in a brain health crisis. So how do you boost your brain power? How can better brain health help you focus on what's most important? Brain training is a part of the way that we would distinguish ourselves from others. Quite frankly, I think it's going to be commonplace in businesses in years to come. We are seeing an epidemic of mental health concerns. Stress and overload lead to depression, anxiety, and burnout. Our brains hold the key to navigate these hurdles. It's never too soon to start. I think the greatest national security threat is pre-K through 12. If we don't take care of educating our young men and women, mm. then we have to ask ourselves, where, where are we going to be in 20 years? Research shows training middle schoolers how to think, problem solve, and innovate significantly improves academic achievement. Even more importantly, it enhances confidence and well-being for them to thrive throughout their lives. It really helps the kid and it builds their stamina. I genuinely credit my success in the classroom from this program. The key to the future is stronger brain health for individuals and communities. Ready to transform the world with us? Be a part of the brain health revolution. It starts here. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Center for Brain Health and day four of Brain Health Week. We have been launching our first annual Brain Health Week. We'll be doing this every February going forward. And today we couldn't be more excited with the agenda. I'll introduce Bob and Jen in one second, but just wanted you to know I'm Stephen White. I am the Chief, Exec or Chief Operating Officer here at Center for Brain Health. We're part of the University of Texas at Dallas. And we are solely focused on two things. One is core academic research on uh, how we can make our healthy brains healthier longer through cognitive neuroscience research. And then translating that research, taking it off the shelf and applying it in the real world, creating ways to arm people with that tool set to that complicated thing called your brain. So. Today, we're going to talk about good disruption, which sounds a little bit like an oxymoron. Uh, and we're excited to have with us Bob Gold. And I'm going to get Bob's title right because it's really cool. And they're going to explore a little bit more about what that is. But Bob is the chief clinical behavioral technologist and founder of GOMO Health. It's not the only thing he's founded. Uh, Bob is a huge influencer in lifestyle medicine. Uh, he's an innovator at his core. He's developed other companies. Uh, I'm going to let them let him explore that with Jen. And we also have our very own Jen Zients, who heads up all of our clinical programs. Jen has helped develop our SMART program, which is how we do high-performance brain training. But I'm going to leave the time to, to Bob and Jen. And virtual audience, please use the Q&A for questions. We are going to save some time at the end for your questions, which I'll be uh, monitoring. 
So put those in the Q&A. We're going to vet those and get to as many of those as we can at the end. So I'm going to turn it over to Bob and Jen. Thanks for joining us. Thank Thanks. you, Steve. Um, good morning, Bob. It's so cool to um, see you. And we had a really interesting and cool collaboration over several years. And I will say that um, for this being a, a talk on good disruption, what you brought to our team was a good disruptor. And the way that you helped me to think and the way that our team really thought about a lot of our content and the way that we deliver. So I just wanna give a kudos to start out with because I think that disruption, like Steve said, disruption can obviously be construed and interpreted in negative ways. So tell me, just let's just first talk, this is like fireside chat, but how do you define disruption what is what are things and then give us some examples of things that are disruptive that, that everybody kind of re recognizes or that may they not they know but they may not recognize as having been disruptive does that make sense right yes yeah by the way let me just say this uh this you're looking at the real jay-z forget the celebrity uh but this jay-z is much cooler much cooler so i just want to say after working with you you. Uh, for a few years. So, you know, basically, um, disruption, innovation, you know, those kind of words are almost synonymous, right? Because if you're going to invent something that hasn't existed, it's disrupting most people's day. And many people will not like that. And it's interesting to uh, just play on the video a little bit that played you know, even good disruption or innovation or positive change causes anxiety and stress because you're changing how people work, live, play, right? So I think whether uh, disruption is a change in the political system or for those of you who work at companies, maybe you're thinking about uh, process improvement or how you can produce a better product or come out with a new innovation product, right? Or you need to change how you manage your family because people are heading down a path that's not necessarily positive. And that's a disruption as well. So there's lots of forms of disruption that need to happen. I love like innovation. That's what we always talk about is um, one of our, the key cognitive strategies that we want people to understand. I think it's interesting to think about being innovative, being um, creative, being a disruptor. When I think about all those things, I, I tend to think that in general, people would consider that a mindset or I am that or I'm not, right? right? And so we know like we, have, we teach strategies that help people to think about things in different ways to be more flexible. But talk about you, you clearly, you clearly have a mindset. You are somebody who is like this. And talk about what was like the very first thing that you did that was disruptive, whether that it, whether it was in your adulthood or even like back in childhood. Yeah, so I, I would say just something that fun comes to my mind. It was in my adulthood, you know, I worked with the... Um, New Jersey Department of Agriculture. I live in Jersey. And um, this was in the 90s. And there was a lot of building going on. And these builders wanted to take this one town in New Jersey, which has a whole historic farming town, and build these homes. So I worked with the town. And I ended up buying 90 acres, uh, converting it into back to an organic farm. I uh, had to learn all about farming. And I worked the farm for five, six years and we formed a co-op of, I got a co-op of Amish farmers and others, 90 of us. And we sold our jointly to restaurants and supermarkets. And I started a community supported agriculture program where people would pay and come each week and pick up a basket. And in other words, but if you look back about 25 years, it was sort of the precursor of the organic movement, you know, and I ended up selling the uh, farm and the town back to the town and we preserved the land, but it was sort of helped launch 
a better, healthier eating movement in New Jersey. So it was kind of neat. That's so neat. So do you see, are a lot of the things that you've done that are disruptive, innovative, are they because you've seen an opportunity? Like you worked in the Department of Agriculture, you saw this land, or is are these these ideas that just like pop into your head that you want to explore and do? So I'm going to answer that first. Second, it's interesting when you say I have a mindset. One thing I clearly learn and I educate and teach and we do is you can practice and train your brain to get better at good disruption or innovation or positive change. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but to your point, uh, to get to the story about how I do it. So I'll just give you one of my favorite co- quotes from Albert Einstein, who was arguably one of the most rational scientists on the face of the earth. He has hundreds of inventions, including a lot of them we know, but his quote I love is, imagination is more important than knowledge I never came upon my discoveries through the process of rational thinking. So to answer your question, and then I'm gonna throw it back to you to talk about brain breaks and less is more, but you need to spend time imagining. Like if you're going to innovate or cause disruption, if something's not working at work, at family, at here, and you wanna disrupt that positively, you need to really take a break. Less is more, reflect. So, um, and if you don't do that, it's, you're just going to go from one transaction to the other and contribute to the mental health pandemic in the U.S. So, but to give you an example, um, I went down the 90s. I had little kids at the time. We went to Disney World, right? And I was walking through Epcot and, you know, and I was just relaxed, imagining this place. And I said, you know, what's interesting at the time I was applying my behavior modification and financial services. So uh, understanding money and how to deal with that. So there was nothing about money in all of Epcot or Disney. Like they had an exhibit uh, AT&T on telecom and GE on the refrigerator and, but there's the, and money and health are two things. So I came up with the concept I just sat down and reflected about Money World. I actually met with the head of Imagineering at Disney. I met with the head of Epcot. I got them to approve Money World. I got NASDAQ to sign a letter of intent, the stock exchange for $10 million to build a Money World exhibit in a fun, cool, wholly different way, like to teach everyone, but in a really cool way. And then what happened is um, there was a crash on the stock market in October of 2000, just when we were doing this, and then 9-11 hit, we never got back to it. But my whole point to your point was, if I didn't take the time to just to meander and think and figure things out, never would have come up with the idea of money world at Disney. It wouldn't have happened. I would have been too transactional, right? So, So maybe you could talk a little bit about neuroplasticity and, you know, flexibility of thing and you know how the brain likes to do that if you allow it to do that right well I just gotta say first of all I think it's cool that um I think in our very busy world and our very busy lives now we are it is so often that we're transactional because we just have to sort of get the next thing done but it's so it's like you have to be methodical but then not methodical at the same time and that's where I think it's cool what you're talking about you have to And when I say methodical, it's like you have to plan for breaks. You need to plan for this downtime. You need to have kind of plan to be imaginative. Now, the the not methodical part is what you're going to be imaginative on, perhaps, right? Like, just let your mind go. And I, thanks for giving me that segue, because I think that's one of the things that we don't, our mental energy is so finite every single day, you know, how we spend our time. And ultimately, I think we are very creative when things go wrong. We're resourceful. We're able to on the spot, fix a problem, you know, like something popped up with my kids. I can course correct, you know, as quickly as possible. But I think that our default mode network, that part of our brain, that's kind of our innovator, our, our um, entrepreneur and pops ideas it doesn't do that if we don't, if we're constantly going, going and, you know, trying to 
trying to um, tr trying to manage our whole to do and trying to like check, do the checkbook, trying to make dinner, trying to do all these things that life kind of keeps consistently handing us. And so we have, you know, different networks in our brain. And one of them being the central executive network comes online when we're really actively thinking and planning and organizing. But then our default mode network comes online when we are just sort of mind wandering. And it, it, the default mode network is cool because it's responsible for great things like these ideas you pop, but also bad things too sometimes. So when we have, when there's depression and anxiety, our default mode network can be the thing that gets us in a rumination cycle. So I think it's kind of interesting when you talk about, you know, I, I think that there's something, we definitely know we need brain breaks because in order to sustain the mental energy, even on a daily basis, we need to have short breaks, just like with our physical body when we go to the gym. But I think the other thing is immersing yourself in, in an environment, you know, being at Epcot, which is so inventive and in so many ways, putting yourself in the environment that you don't know what you're going to be thinking about, but that you're kind of, it's, it's not like you're just mind wandering, you know, and like thinking about random things. Right. Right. So I think that's really um, cool. And I could see that as being a very, a place type of training ground, if you will, of not necessarily Epcot, but certain environments, certainly um, whether it's a workspace um, or, or your own home when we're having to figure out how we're going to work from home, you know, a couple years ago, those kinds of things. So, um, yeah. Okay. And I just want to make a comment on, uh, you know, you use the word rumination and breaks and all those things. So uh, interesting. So we run a program, uh, my company, Gummo Health, for we're the platform for Humana's well-being program for their employees, right? So when we took it over a few years ago, it was this portal and people had to go to it. So if you were stressed and they had some good content, but if you were stressed and needed a 10 minute break because you were going to a meeting or something happened, it would take you 20 minutes to find the content way through it. And uh, you don't remember your login. So that, that wasn't going well. So, um, we completely changed it where we ask people questions and we go to them at various times of day and then they could text one code and get a brain break. So the program is actually called Take 10 for, for Yourself because everything we send them are 10 minute mental or physical things that they can do very simply at a desk, outside, at a home. You don't need equipment. It's just different things you can do to take 10 minutes out of your day. Right, so you could stop the rumination, you practice, you know, thinking, being healthier mentally, right? And just one other interesting comment. So, you know, we've really changed, you talk about good disruption. So for a lot of people going through chronic health conditions, okay, whether it be um, anxiety, stress, or diabetes, heart, COPD, we've, recrafted health at home care plans that are brain first and body second because the mistake healthcare made they separated the mind from the body you know it's ridiculous because uh a lot of it is your choice what your brain chooses to focus and do so we've actually lowered a1c's tremendously we've reduced medical costs by up to 50 percent with people we reduced avoidable emergency department visits by 60%. Like this is across the US. And we've also helped underserved communities as an example, who have epigenetics, a culture of like maybe being put down or not being treated fairly and stuff. So sometimes you have to help people unlearn to learn. So you have to work with them to introduce concepts, enable them to practice something in their life seeing that they can do it and that starts to change their outlook their perspective right so they become more confident to do things right so those are all like techniques in you know good disruption because how do you actually change a mindset a cognitive perspective 
Right. So what do you think is one of the keys to just to access in general? Like, I mean, you talk about, you know, underserved communities, but in general, I would even argue that um, getting, obviously you've done such an amazing job, but this idea that you can send text messages to individuals to affect their behavior from a medical perspective and in choice how do you, what, what's a key to that you actually see as the cracking of that into getting people to embrace that kind of change? Yeah, so um, the, there's three kind of key things. One, and then I'll explain a little bit, you know, how we do it, but the, there's really three key things to get people to embrace. One is they have to believe that what you're sending them, first of all, they have to believe that you understand who they are. That's number one, right? So you can be a smart coach in basketball if the, if your students don't think you understand them or get their life, they're not gonna listen as much. The second is they have to believe the content applies to them and their life. You know, so if you just look at healthcare, it's like, oh, this doctor nurse is telling me stuff they have no idea my stress, my life. They haven't lived my life. Like, you know, that's for everyone else. That's not for me, right? And then third is they have to believe they can perform the tasks you're telling them. Because if I gave someone a list of things to do, and even if they understood it, educated, got it, and they didn't think they could do it, why try? Like, so those are the things. So what we do is we first ask a lot of questions in the technology you're talking about. So in the tech world, it would be called machine learning or a bot. So we, then we individualize it. We ask you, you know, certain things about your personal determinants, your home, your life, your, what you're going through. And then we start to message you in a way that resonates, right? So, and we're asking a lot of questions, we're learning. So we don't immediately spill our guts at everything you need to do today, Jen. (laughs) You know, so we start to build trust, we will not put them in harm's way, and credibility will further their cause. Those are two wholly different things cognitively, trust and credibility. So if you could score high on those and have a high believability score, people are willing to learn and listen and learn and act. And then we send them a thought at a time, a question at a time, and then if they respond, the whole engagement adjusts. So they actually feel that we're reciprocal. Because if you want someone to be loyal to you or follow something, you have to show them you're loyal to them first. You know, it's interesting. It's not, I don't understand why, you know, Joe is not following everything I'm saying. Well, Joe's not following because he doesn't understand how it applies to him. He doesn't think you're listening. He doesn't think he could do the task. So you have to, you build it up over time. So then basically what happens the technique we call mild, micro learning and doing combo. So we try to get people to get a little bit of a better routine that forms a schedule. The schedule starting to change their outlook and their perspective. And then that could form a positive habit. And then we got them, right? Then you got them. But that takes a disciplined approach you're not going to do overnight. So it's really the idea on how we do it. But you can affect people's lives greatly with a simple text. I mean, think about it. People have went off on different tangents positively or negatively by listening to a song, by reading a book, by seeing a movie, by seeing something on the news. So it doesn't take a 10 page email to get that done, right? Like you just have to inspire people. And then in cognitive neuroscience, have them have several aha moments. Ah, ah, I guess. Well, and I think to me, okay, there's two things you just talked about that I want to kind of dig in a little bit on was just incremental. So like this idea of being about incremental messaging change, whatever, and also confidence, confidence building. Um, Also, I think just the value of perspective taking, that's what you're talking about. That's how we can be successful in breaking into um, different areas that we don't know. I think a lot of people, obviously this is, duh is like it's a no-brainer that people know 
when you don't know a lot, you need to listen to the people who you're trying to serve, the, the problems you're trying to solve. Um, but I think it's, it can't be underscored the value of an expertise is only so much, right. but without having a perspective of the target that, you know, it kind of can fall short. So one of the things I want to talk about is like this, just this idea of incremental, um, the idea of what is incremental and how profound that can be. Because I think like you talked about at the beginning, disruption being something, you know, kind of this new, a lot of times being a very, a new thing that we're really doing and having these great new ideas that are changing up some kind of system. But also I think that in getting people on board, obviously, like you've seen a lot of success with this incremental push, which um, that's just something, it's a message I just want. I think everyone knows that, but when people are highly innovative and, and disruptive, sometimes it is just, it's incremental things. So these small things that come, and I think it can be daunting to some people. Um, so I also want to get to like how you actually mentor others, because I think this idea that I really want to do something big and different, but like, how do I even get started? We have to sort of know the incremental, like, where are we going to start? But then those are the kinds of things that build confidence, like what you already talked about. And confidence is something that gives us dopamine and it really rewards our brain with norepinephrine. And we start changing our neuropharmacy when we start seeing that. So another thing I want to talk about, which we can get to is also just like mental health and stress. But let's first just talk about, um, you know, how do you, you, you said it before, you really do believe you can train a brain, right. To be more innovative, disruptive. How How do you mentor people? Like, what do you, like, what's, what's somebody, where does somebody start if they have these really great ideas, but it's like, where do, how do I get started? Okay. Yeah. So I have kind of a few things that you have to act on as a quote, a change agent, but just to say real simply as a simple start, whether it's incremental change or highly disruptive or innovative is what I call storytelling. You know, it's a technique that says Walt Disney mastered, so to speak, but, you know, storytelling is the key. So in other words, if you have an idea to change a process, whether it's changing the time your family eats at home or changing a product at work or you're a senator in a state and you want to change a law, you know, instead of focusing on the fact of what the change is and potential benefits, tell the story about what life is like after the change for people. See, because to your point, people ruminate like, okay, well, I see why that may be good, but here's all the negative. You have to train their brain to think about, hey, do you know, folks, here's what your life would be like. Here's a day in your life after the change is made. You know, you're not going to have to do this anymore. Oh, and they're like, oh yeah, no, I don't have to do that. Okay. And this forgetting even what the change is. So what you do is put it in context of who you need to influence or who you need to participate about their life after the change. It's not about the change. It's about their life after the change. And how much better it's going to be. And then people start, see, what you want to do is let them ruminate on that positive change in their life and talk about it. Not, oh, my God, Bob's changing our structure here in the organizationally and, oh, horrible. No, look what life's going to be like. So that's a, a, a good technique. So and then if a little tip is you could actually read up how you tell stories like there's a plot, there's a hero. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. Like you have to become good at telling stories and that's practice too, right? So there's, uh, you could definitely do that. And then the other thing I just want to say is what people really, you talk about like taking a break or understanding who you are. So everyone needs to just take a little minute and say, okay, if I'm going to introduce a change, what is the audience, whether the audience, my family, my boss, my peers, my friends, my cousins, 
what's the audience perception of my personal brand? So I'll give you an example. Like when I was, let's say I'm running a companies and two people would come to me with ideas and I would go with, uh, you know, Janie's idea, not Joey's. And Joey would come to me and say, how come you went with Janie? And, you know, basically I have to tell Joey, well, I don't believe you can execute against that idea, no matter how good or bad it is. So I'm not going with you. Now, if he under, if he took the time to kind of understand how Bob felt about his personal brand, he maybe would have brought a partner who is more on the execution side with me and Joey has a good mind. And now um, Jeanette is a good executor. And they would have, he, if he thought about that before he came to me and understood that. So everyone should think about their own personal brand. Like how is it perceived? Do people perceive me as having a lot of ideas, but I'm not so sure about execution. Do they perceive me as a good executor, but I don't have ideas. And then you could build your team. It's sort of logically how, how any leader builds a cabinet or people around them. They should complement them so the team is more believable, right? So that's another technique. Just really think about your believability in these things if you want to accomplish change and take the time to do that and then build the story and the team that will be believable, right? So those are my two cents on that. Well, I think that's cool. You you bring up a point. Um, do you think so? We've we've often been asked if, and and I know there's lots of like with strengths finders and a lot of the these um, types of personality leadership um, organizational types of assessments. We have also been asked if if you can test somebody and figure out how do we get somebody who's strategic, somebody who's innovative, somebody who's big picture. And that kind of go, well, I'll say that in a second. What I really want to know from you, Bob, is when is it, how, how do you, do you think that you can train somebody to be, you know, to Joey, who didn't approach you that way now, but you believe in Joey for whatever reason, how do you, how do you train Joey to be able to learn how, learn you and how to approach you better? How do you, what, like, how, do you do that? How do you do that? Right. Yes. Yes. So basically there's some step functions, you know, to do that on, um, you know, how you do that. So I think I covered one of the first ones is kind of a self-assessment to understand the basis, right? Because whether you're good naturally at change or not, or disruption, doesn't matter. You can be trained. So the first thing is to understand the beast, so to speak, who you are, right, as a person. And sort of like they would call it in other cases, SWAT, you know, strengths, weakness, you know, what what is it? And more from be the audience, not from what you think you are, right? Because it's shocking to me when people tell me who they think they are and it's like, well, you're nothing like that. Like, you know, so it's really taking a little time into understanding who you are and then understanding the mindset. The next is, okay, what are you trying, to, who are you trying to influence? What do you think their brain and cognitive and behavior issues are right now? And what do you think their issues will be when you present any idea. So let's just think that through. It doesn't matter what the idea is. Like, is this an organization? Are you employed in an organization that never changes? Is it the crazy boss upstairs? You know, what's the environment, right? Okay. Like in a lot of our clients or hospitals or healthcare plans, you move a staple, it's, you know, 50 committee meetings in a year. So you just have to know the environment right? You could make change happen, right? And then the other training I do is on conflict, right? Conflict. So I do this thing, I do a little education and master's in entrepreneurial studies. And uh, I, I, one of my principles is conflict is wonderful. And they're like, looking at me like I'm nuts. And I'm saying, why is conflict wonderful? So it's sort of like, um, 
any area, but in healthcare, they talk about early detection and intervention. The earlier you could screen or detect something, the better. So the earlier you deal with conflict, the less painful it is in the end of the day. But because none of us really like conflict, you shy away from it and then it bubbles up. So there are definitely ways of detecting conflict situations because if you thought about who you are, you thought about the audience, what the issues are, you could kind of almost predict the conflict. Then how you deal with the conflict could be awesome because you see, if you are perceived as a person that could deal with conflict earlier and get it done, you'll get a huge raise, promotion, you'll get any job you want, you'll get any change you want because it, it's all a matter of how people think of you. If you have all these good ideas and you're sitting there wondering why they're never executed, well, maybe you don't, people don't have the confidence that you could deal with the conflict to make it happen, right? So then, you know, there's definitely stuff on how the brain works for you and the audience and dealing with conflict, anxiety, stress, those types of things, right? Um, so I think, and then it's the idea of, how do you get what I talked about us practicing better health or something? Could you introduce little things that start seeding the change? Sort of without even saying it, mm -hmm. right? So now you're trial closing, right? So there's tiny little things. And then you tell the story about, oh, look at that. Look what's going on. And then so when you're introducing the change, it's better. Like I do some talks for Fortune 500 executive boards. And one of the strategies I always tell the executive is you got to trial close the board for the vote before the board meeting. Like, and here's how you do it. <laughs> you want it wired, right? You want the election wired so you get the change you want, right? So then, you know, those types of things. But it really all deals with being external. Everything I'm saying deals with being externally focused outside of your mind and your body. That's really the key. Really focus on your environment, the people, their issues, who you need to influence. You got to set your brain to that as opposed to you ruminating on why things won't happen and your frustrations. And that's training. Yeah. Well, and I think that helps you to get your to activate your frontal networks because you're having to be more logical, reasonable, think like thinking through perspectives versus being in your limbic system, which is that emotional rumination, all that kind of stuff. So absolutely. I think it's the more the faster, even if, if even if the the logical thinking doesn't end up coming to, you know, to bear, that process in general as a practice helps us to downregulate that emotional rumination. And so you're right, I think it's, um, it helps us to get more activated quicker. Um, okay, I have, a, I have a couple, this is kind of going off on a different note. Well, okay, no, first I wanna talk about mental health. Um, obviously there's a massive crisis in this country and probably globally around mental health and stressors and depression and anxiety. And we are, um, you know, diagnosing more and it's pre prescribing meds more and still not really changing and moving the needle a whole bunch. What have you seen from your, like from with the work at, at GOMO, um, talk about what, what kind of the trends you're seeing, the impacts that what your work is doing in the mental health sphere. Yeah. So a few fascinating things going on in that regard and uh, impactful. Um, and then, as you know, Jen, we're working together on some brain health programs that deployed for employers and other folks with mental health issues. But, um, you know, the first thing I want to say is that in a lot of cases, health, mental health, for those lucky enough to have a family or friends or caregiver people involved is a family challenge, right? Because, so I just wanna say that's really important. Like, um, because a lot of people's mental health issues affect those around them, right? So one of the techniques we use, right? Is whether we're doing uh, mental health for an employer or we're doing uh, 
We do drug recovery programs for ma major states, for people. Um, is we really encourage and nurture family members participating. So in other words, a lot of times to use an extreme case. So one of the advisors is former uh, retired Brigadier General Chief Psychiatrist of Special Forces in the United States of America, you know, the SEALs and this and that. And a lot of times the family, let's say the wife or others want to help, but they don't always know what to do. They don't understand how the brain, what to do. Sometimes they actually create more stigma for the person and stuff. So one is in mental health, we try to engage the loved ones around people, not just telling them what to do and then suggesting activities to do with those folks. So we suggested to the family, for the person, for the person, for the family, you know. So we're trying to build, you know, kind of a connected social network in a positive way. So that's one, you know, real, uh, I think, important technique that we do, right? And then the other thing is, in the health industry, at least, and others, they talk about social determinants of health, right? So if you need, let's say, in terms of a hierarchy of need, if you have food insecurity or you have, um, you, you have no transportation or no housing, it's hard to focus on your physical or mental health, right? So in those cases, one of the techniques we've done to give you an example, has been wildly successful in Montana. Um, we actually added a track to help people get full-time employment. This is very interesting because we saw in our analysis of the data, the relationship to people not employed in their mental health. And then the how it got better if they felt gainfully employed, because think about it, affects their, who they feel they are. Their so in Montana, in this program, uh, this drug recovery program, we got 49.6% increase in full-time employment of the people. So interestingly, we gave them tips on interviewing, how to do it, how sort of what they call in um, cognitive psychology, th thinking errors, which is stupid, but like a lot of these people feel a victim. I can't be useful to society. So you're ruminating, you're going down a bad pathway of depression. So what we do is we help them in the little mild ways, think through and change their perspective. And then we give them a little, we include the family and now we're helping them get employed and you should see the data. Like, you know, some of, we have a few of them who've now become peer specialists at the behavioral health organization that was treating them for, various levels of um, mental challenges. So, you know, that that's it. So you got to look at the mind and the body. It's like the whole life. Like sometimes these things that aren't obvious, mm -hmm. oh, getting someone a full-time job will help with mental health. Like, but it's not how healthcare works. Okay, I'll treat you with your brain, but that's nothing to do with the rest of your life, right? And you need to do those together. So treat the whole person. Yeah, yeah I, I think those are techniques. That's amazing because I think number one, you're right. I think everything in this country, it, we're, we're all we're very siloed in the way that we look at everything. And I mean, you see this with people who have multiple doctors with multiple prescriptions, you know, kind of everywhere. But I think another thing that really like this sparked a cool idea for me. It goes back to this idea about imagination, and that to me, Bob, is an example of you know we talk a lot about possibility thinking. And the idea that it, when people can see possibilities for themselves, it may help to shift narratives. You know, um, we've, been, we've been looking at this kind of in the military as far as trajectory of suicide, for example. You know, if, if people can start to see there's other options, different ways to advance and different roads to take, maybe it'll switch. Maybe kids will have, you know, our youth will have more, see more opportunities for themselves and be more willing. But what I hear this, I'm just tying it because you talked at the beginning about the importance of imagination and matching 
you know, jobs with mental health is like imagining on behalf of somebody. Oh, that's interesting. I, I've never thought of it that way. But yes. I I just think it's, yes, it's so that's very good. Yeah, I think that there's that that's one of my big ahas. Imagining is, on behalf of somebody. That's an awesome quote, Jen. I love that. Thank you. And, you know, maybe that adds to storytelling is like, imagine, you know, or that's right. kind of storytelling to your point is how do we imagine on behalf of others who, for whatever reason, they either are, you know, in cycles of depression, stress, anxiety, or just low confidence, you know, and just not feeling like they, they can't go in, like, there's just nothing else that they can do that's different, that's, you right. know big or small. And um, yeah, so I, I think that's super cool to think about that. Um, oh, hi, Steve. Are we ready for some questions? If you have another one, go and then we'll, because we're getting some good questions. Uh, All right, you look pretty dapper, Steve. I'm saying I like it. Thank you. I Jen, just... Jen makes it, I can't show up to the office if Jen's here and looks sloppy. So she's, <laughs> general science keeps us in tow. That's funny. Um, okay, I just let me just ask you one more question, Bob. Failure and like when things don't go right. So it's always so cool when we hear about cool things, disruptions that were successful. And e even like Money World, I wouldn't say that was a failure. That was like a circumstantial thing, right? Like a, in the circumstances of the world. But what happens when things don't you put in so much effort and you really see that it's going to happen and it doesn't right yeah no and that is definitely a training and learn behavior okay because you know like myself as you get older and i've done all these things i've gotten better at it but the interesting thing is just to talk about that for a second so um they've never built a statue of a committee i just want to start with that right like so in other words, if you're going to do disruption, you need a mindset that you're going to try to drive it through. Like consensus, in most cases, thwarts disruption and change doesn't help it, right? So, so there is, could be a feeling of loneliness, of isolation. Why am I doing this? I'm the only one who cares, right? So that's a training of the mind to a perspective and then just know also it's like failure breeds success because if you look at quotes from Thomas Edison, he said he only invented the light bulb because he failed 109 times and it was his 110th, otherwise he would never would have done it, right? So it also, as you know, the people say it all the time, well, hey, we learned a lot. You know, you could learn a lot, mm -hmm. okay? And so you just have to know going into it like a baseball player, if I'm going to hit 300, that's damn good. Even That means I'm not getting a hit 70% of the time, right? And so if you're going to do that, just know that that's the ratio and feel good about what you're doing. And then to the point, Jen, you brought up, you can practice with smaller incremental changes, the things I said. So you're getting used to it. Maybe you're getting some setbacks, this. And, and then when you have some more aha moments, you build your own confidence. You can go for more uh, bigger disruptive changes. But yeah, it's definitely something that you're gonna face. And you know how you look on it should be positive a failure because it's gonna get you to the next place. But Absolutely. I know. I think I, I think about that 30, 70. Yeah. Like baseball. That's good. <laughs> Most that people are that. Right. So keeping that in perspective, too, I think is um, sometimes it's 80, 20. <laughs> right. That makes me feel better about my GPA. So that's good. <laughs> um, listen, what's really cool is I love it when a plan comes together, even when it's by accident. Because part of slotting Bob in today at this time was a calendaring issue, right? I mean, it was, we're working on that. But look at what we did in the brain health journey we're doing in this week. We talked about growth mindset on Monday. We talked about clarity uh, on Tuesday. We talked about meaningful connections 
uh, yesterday, and boom, here's Bob and Jen weaving all those together. I mean, it really, it really is pretty cool. But let me get to some of the questions. And so Bob said two things today that are fascinating because he's an innovator. But just today, by practicing thinking outside the box, he said, I've never thought of that of it that way. And he said, I've gotten better at it. So Bob's still a work in progress, right? We can oh, all yeah, I, I need a lot of we work. do. Right. So you 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 never have it right, right? I mean yeah, that's and just one comment on that. So real quick. So I have four qualities in order actually you need to even affect any change, small large. One is you need to believe in yourself. Two, you need to believe in others. And there's a fascinating reason I say that. Third is uh, you need to view life as a journey, not a destination. So, Steve, I'm I'm on that journey and I'm learning. Because when you stop learning, it kind of not as interesting life. And then fourth is key. You need to feel compelled to act because a lot of people have good ideas is that and they just don't act on it. So those are the four things. Believe in yourself. Others, others have to believe in that. Others have to know that you believe in them. And then they'll follow you more, right? Uh, view life as a journey and act. And act is where you get the failures, right? Act is where you get the failures, but that's going to lead to a better journey for you and everyone else. And Jen, Jen talks about reframing all the time so you don't get stuck in a failure, right? If you do, then you're just kind of, yeah. So it, it leads into a question by an anonymous attendee. I'd love to give him credit, but... What do you do, Bob, as a leader on your team for those that are really the successful grinders? They're the executors. So you don't want them to feel like they're missing out if, if they're not on the innovation team. How do you strike that balance of encouraging your grinders to do a good job, but not forgetting there's a little bit of innovation we all need to, to think about? Yeah, so... Um... I sort of have a channeled chaos theory of organizational design, but that's a whole different topic. So, but anyway, um, so how do you do that? It's actually simple. It's really simple. So look, people naturally are more attuned to certain things and then they can be trained, right? But so if you, just to use your words, grinders or people who let's say more enjoy the execution of something than changing something, there's plenty of work and need for that. So if you, let's say, have a department and the industry, the competition, something, the product needs changing, you don't task your execution team to do that. You have a little team that could figure out the change. They could get their input. And then this that team is probably good at executing the new thing, but don't try to give them frustrating assignments and goals that they're not necessarily want to do or do do. Um, so I would say, and then what you do is even within that, to Jen's point, you give the execution folks, there's a little way of giving them things to think about to make tiny little changes in how they execute. So they are feeling I'm changing the process, but the, but the bigger changes, you don't you know, you give to other people, right? So that's, so I think there's a good pathway because without X, there is no innovation without execution. Like, so you need the well, executors. A great example of one of the best innovations was all about execution and that's Dollar Shave Club. He didn't invent new razor blades. The execution was, the innovation was just delivering them in a different way. It was pure execution. Exactly, right. Yeah. It just yeah, so there's a great role for those folks who are more attuned to that, who enjoy that, who like that. So this is a question for both of you from Ken. So what do you do? Is your team doing something, Bob, about mental health in schools? And that's a big question. Are you getting access to schools? And Jen, after Bob's answer, could you talk about how we've tried to address that in schools through through our programs? Yeah, it's interesting. So in the last 12 months, you've been asked to really get involved, and we are. So um, we launched with our first college uh, this year, kind of a our GOMO mental health program. We're launching with 
a few high schools and we're going to go down to middle school. We're now launching with 90 schools in a certain area. And, you know, the, the part of the theme of that is what they call in cognitive psychology sense of agency. So our, our kind of thesis, it goes back to some of the stuff we talked about. Uh, look, teenagers, their logic is just forming in the brain. You know, for women, it's like 22, 20, 21 guys. It's like maybe never, but 23, you know, logic forms in the brain. So, um, so they're still figuring out who they are, right? So, you know, experimentation at that age is even natural, experimenting with drugs, experimenting with different things. But a lot of them feel now in this crazy transactional world with social media, ADD, they feel kind of, they don't know what to do. They're lost. They're a victim. They go from one one hit of TikTok to this on Facebook, to this, this. So what our goal is to get them to feel a little bit more that they have more influence in their life than they think. They can steer their life. Um, they could have a little bit more control, right? Um, whether you don't like your parents or you think they're not the ticket, you feel bullied, you don't have a lot of friends. So uh, our whole focus in the school program is more dealing with the mind and how I can feel better about myself so I don't have suicidal ideation, so I don't use drugs as an escape. And yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so schools is a, a growing program for us. And I just want to add to that, I think there's two big things for our for our us and our work at Center for Brain Health. Number one is this idea of self-agency and getting people um, as soon as possible, as soon as they really can, because you're right, our frontal lobes aren't fully developed till we're a lot older. And so here we have this whole group of a generation of people, multiple generations of people who are dealing with very difficult things and adversity without full capacity of their cognitive ability. The other thing though, is that we look at brain health as a superordinate level of health under which, brain, under which mental health falls. So thinking about stress, depression, anxiety are components and they contribute, but how we think, how we use our frontal networks can affect our emotional outlook and our emotional well-being. And so we have two different, you know, we've got a couple different programs, but two very big programs I think that we've seen a lot of success in is one is a charisma, our charisma program. It's a VR program that's specifically um, geared toward individuals with social emotional um, challenges. Initially, it started with people with social cognitive diagnoses like, you know, high level autism or after traumatic brain injury or after, you know, with ADD, for example, but it has really, it's, it's grown into people don't have to access this with, they don't, you don't have to have a diagnosis to access. And it is a way to practice a lot of these, you know, socially to practice a lot of what you're talking about, Bob, like bullying scenarios, um, you know, drug encounters, interviewing for a job, going into a cafeteria and finding somebody to have lunch with so that you have these ways to practice in a VR world, some real life thing. Another thing has been our adolescent reasoning initiative, where that's been a lot more about academic focus and um, information absorption. And how do we, you know, we've done a lot of our, our team has done incredible work specifically in, you know, underrepresented communities and, um, what they've seen, one of they've seen many things, but one of the things I've been most inspired by is the level of self-agency when you start to teach students that how they learn, there isn't just one way to learn, and that when teachers also get inspired to test and to engage with content in ways that are not right and wrong, but what is all of the middle ground in between and, you know, Joey sees one thing and Bob sees something else and Jen sees something else and Steve something else. And they're all right. There, there's not just one right. And so I think when students start to see that this right and wrong, yes, no, pass, fail mentality isn't the only way, I think it, it starts to become, and I, there's more confidence in around education and um, academic performance. 
Yeah, yeah. and just can I make one more comment on sure. that or you want to move on? No, go ahead. So, so you know, it's interesting because a lot of what we do is to try to reach the people who don't want to engage. So in healthcare, it's like uh, 30% of men don't see a doctor, 20% of women. Like, so, so, how, so if I take schools, like what you don't want in these programs are the same third good kids, so to speak, right? You want the middle group that's iffy, and then you want the group that tends to uh, maybe be a little bit more on the darker side. And, but they're least likely to sit there and say, okay, the school has another social worker, psychologist. Okay, I'm sitting in an assembly. You know, this person has no idea who I am, man. I'm from the hood. I'm from this. I'm from that. Like, so interestingly, what we're, we have a division of the company called Gomo Music. We scientifically curate sounds, tones, tunes, decibels for a lot of things. But Regardless of that for a second. So what we're doing in the fall, we're introducing, you could choose how you want to learn. Now, this is interesting. So do you want to learn through music, sports, TV movies, and a few other topics, dance? So in other words, you're going to pick what you kind of are tuned to. And then we're going to use that as a metaphor to weave in this sense of agency that Jen's talking about as opposed to, oh, we have a mental health program for you. Like, really? So it's like, hey, I want to be, I want to make the varsity team. Well, here's how you could train your brain. And of course, then we're getting at lonely, we're getting at asking all the questions we need. Or, you, you know, uh, we're using scenes from TVs and movies that deal with stuff and asking them questions about themselves and getting them to think how they relate. Anyway, it's an interesting thing because. We do this in healthcare, not quite that same thing for adults, but, you know, the goal is to engage the unengaged, right? Because yeah. that's the hard part. Because you so, can have the greatest content yeah. in the world. If they're not willing to listen, they're not experiencing the content. It's, it's true. And it's so funny. Again, I love it when a plan comes together. Dr. Kara Allen from the San Antonio Spurs, their chief impact officer, was telling a story the other day about how she related to someone who didn't think they knew how to do math because the word problem wasn't contextual. They just needed to see it in their through their own context. And then it's like suddenly you're you're more engaged. So two quick, one final question, but I, I want you both to answer it since we're just about to wrap up. Since I've been here, I worry about the balance between technology and what we also say is you need to stop and smell the roses periodically. So we're using, I, I want to talk about disruption versus distraction, because if we use technology too much, we're encouraging people to stay wed to that phone as opposed to using it as a weapon for good. Bob, where do you sit on worrying about that? And Jen, if you could wrap up how we're trying to strike that balance from a brain health perspective. So it's a fascinating question. So first of all, interestingly, I've applied my behavioral cognitive science in a digital therapeutic way, right? So, but I don't use that much technology. I don't enjoy it that much to be quite frank. So what we're doing is very minimal. It's like a thought, a little video, something. It's not about going to this portal app, you know? So we wanna get people, so, but we're giving them things they need to do in their life and suggesting and getting them to do it, rewarding them. So we're we're actually minimizing the use of the technology in some respects, but we're using it because it's important. You need mass scalability. We're gonna change the dynamics in America. So for example, we have a pediatric autism program we launched for caregivers in the state of Georgia. In four months, we have 90,000 caregivers. In. Okay, you're not gonna do that one-to-one. -one. It's just, and now, you'd be shocked at how we help these people in four months. Like, so yes, yeah, so, and also the cost effectiveness of that. So the idea is um, to use it in a way that enables them to do the things Jen's been talking about in terms of flexibility of thinking, less multitasking, you know, brain breaks and those things. It's not that I think technology is the answer. No, it's the brain's the answer, 
but we're doing this because we could affect millions of lives. So that's my answer on that. And Jen, this goes back to your digital fight club thing from a few years ago. <laughs> it does. I know. I think, Bob, totally. I agree with you 100% about scale. You, we cannot reach people. I mean, we're we're in Dallas, Texas. And you know, if you can't come to Dallas, Texas, then you can't access. So in some ways, COVID was an incredible um, disruptor, a good disruptor for us and the way that we operate. So what's cool is that you have this ability to learn and to train your brain like all, in these things that Bob's talking about. And we have the Brain Health Project, which I just want to encourage everybody to check out. It is a scalable, it is online, and it is a dashboard that is moving to an app soon. So you don't have to like be logging in all the time, but we're super excited. But the whole point is part of what we do with the Brain Health Project in the training content, it's strategy-based. And so you get bite-sized, like five or 10 minutes a day, and you can't do anything more. And why, you know, some people want to binge. They, they're kind of on a, uh, they, they, they're on a run. But we want people to learn and apply into their daily life, because just like what you said, if you don't use information, it's not, it's just a distractor. It's never going to be a good disruptor. So I really want to thank you, Bob, so much for this uh, chat You're this welcome. morning. Thank you guys. This is great. I loved it. No, Bob, listen, thanks for all you and GOMO Health are doing to reach so many people and make a difference. We love the fact that we're looking for ways to partner and even have a bigger impact. Thank you yeah. for your time today. Bless you for your grandchild. Uh, oh, that's why Bob you, couldn't man. be here live today. So he's being a he's being a good granddad and dad. So that's and that's thank right. You. That's taking a brain break for the right reasons. That's that's exactly. doing the right thing. So thanks everybody. Thanks to the virtual right. audience for the great questions. See everybody thank later. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.